Um, my name is Fabian. I'm a Summer of Code student this year um, under my mentor, Daniel Pocock. And my project was extending various um, one-time pad authentication packages in Debian to support a new kind of specification for challenge response-based one-time pads. And I'm about halfway done, so this specification is pretty much implemented in two packages. So what's left to do is finishing this implementation um, and the documentation for it as well. And the second part of my project is uh, implementing an SASL extension, which is uh, uh, in different packages using this authentication, authentication mechanism to also support a different specification for challenge response based one time pad. But I will talk today about the stuff I did so far. So basically, most of you know what a one time pad is. It's uh, mainly used in two factor authentication, and there are two widely used uh, specifications for this, both specified by the same foundation. One of them is HOTP, which is event based. Um, there is a counter which gets incremented upon a successful authentication. And this counter is used to calculate an HMAC uh, hash using SHA-1, which is then truncated to display a number between six or eight digits. TOTP works pretty similarly. The moving factor is not a counter, but is derived from the current timestamp so that you can have uh, time windows and one one-time head value is valid for one or more of these windows. So for example, you can say one pad is valid for one minute or 30 seconds. Both of these specifications are already fully supported by packages in Debian. There are PEM modules for them, command line tools, and there are a lot of hardware tokens for these two specifications. And also applications for smartphones and uh, other platforms. So Okra, the specification that I implemented, has the same uh, principle as a foundation. So you have a hashing function. In this case, it's not limited to SHA-1, but you can also use SHA-256 and SHA-512. And you not have a single moving factor as input for which you calculate the HMAC, but you have a whole array of possible inputs. And the only mandatory input is a challenge, which comes from the other party where you want to authenticate. Yes, uh, you can do authentication in both ways. So when you want to log in at a server, um, you can send a challenge to the server. The server verifies who is, sends this back to you. Y you can check whether you're really connecting to the server you want to connect to. Then you get a challenge, and using both challenges, you calculate your own value. There is also a mode uh, for signing data or hashes of data, but I'm not quite sure whether this will be uh, ever used in a wider context, because there's uh, other signing uh, concepts and technology that's a lot better, in my opinion. <laughs> so anyway, how does this work? Uh, as I said, we don't have a moving factor anymore, but we have a big uh, binary array of data, um, which starts with a string, actually, that specifies what else is contained in this binary array. Um, the two zeros over there are just a separator. and then you have the different inputs, which are just concatenated one after the other, if they are included. So the first one is a counter. It works exactly the same like in HOTP. If the authentication is successful, the counter has to be incremented server side. Um, the client always has to um, increment the counter. So as soon as the counters get out of sync, you know something went wrong, and the authentication is blocked until the counters are synced again. Uh, then you have challenge values, I will come back to that later. They are the only input that is mandatory. You can include a password hash uh, using the same three hashing functions, uh, like for the Okra value itself. And there's space for a session information, if you want to include it. So for example, 
if both the client and the server have access to an SSL or TLS session data, you can include this in here to make the Okra value even more resistant to tampering and replaying. And similarly to TOTP, you can also include a timestamp. Um, the window calculation works a bit differently than in TOTP because you can specify windows between one second and 48 hours, which usually doesn't make much sense, but there might be applications where this does work. Yeah, so this is an example of such an Okra seed string that specifies which parameters are used. Um, it starts off with the version of Okra. There is only one so far, so that's always the same. Um, the next element is the um, hashing function. So in the first case, we have SHA-1 truncated to six digits. In the second case, we have SHA-256 uh, not truncated at all. So you can either have no truncation or between four and ten digits. This is also extended from the previous specification where you could only have six, seven, or eight digits. And the last part of this uh, Okra suite string is the actual data input specification. So in the first case, the Q is for the challenge, and it's a numerical challenge using eight characters. In the second case, there's a lot more included, a counter, an alphanumeric, challenge with 20 characters, a password hash, session information of 128 bytes, and a timestamp using 12-minute time windows. Usually you won't do something like in the second case, because <laughs> that's a bit much. Yes, we already had that. So the challenge values can either be numerical, hexadecimal, or alphanumerical, and should be between four and up to 64 characters per challenge. So um, you can have either one or two challenge de challenges, depending on the mode. So if you have two 64-character challenges, they are 128 bytes if they're alphanumeric. So you always pad the challenge part of the data input to 128 bytes, no matter how long the actual challenges were. And the challenge strings themselves are converted to binary data, uh, which is actually working a little bit strange. So if you have an alphanumerical string, you can just copy it, because that's binary data. The hexadecimal um, strings are converted from hex to binary. But numerical strings are not converted from base 10 to binary, but the number is converted to, to a hex string, and the hex string is then converted to binary. That's how it's in the specification and the reference implementation. It's a bit strange. Yes. So how does the actual authentication work? Uh, you can have three modes, one-way authentication, two-way or mutual authentication, or the signature mode. So in case of a one-way authentication, the client has to tell the server somehow that uh, it wants to log in or authenticate, so it has to send some kind of request for a challenge. This might be waking up at a screensaver or actually really initiating some login process. The server responds by generating a challenge according to the Okra suite specification and sends this challenge back to the client. The client uses the challenge value, the locally stored specification, and the secret key to calculate an HMAC value and truncate it. And the resulting number is sent back to the server, who can validate this value by using the same shared secret key and the same specification. And it then tells the client whether the login was successful or not, of course. The two-way authentication works basically the same, but a little bit uh, uh, some additional steps are included. So this time the client initiates the authentication by generating a challenge for the server, sending it to the server. The server can use this um, server challenge to calculate its own value. Um, you can basically have uh, two variants of this. It's not specified uh, in the RFC how you should do this. I chose to use the more flexible route and um, store 
a server specification and secret key for every user. So you can have a different specification and different key for every user. You could also do a global key for the server authentication part. Um, the server then has to send its value and a new challenge for the client back to the client. The client can validate the value it received to see whether uh, this is really uh, the server it thinks it is. Afterwards, after checking whether uh, the value was uh, valid, it can calculate a client value using both challenges. So you use the server challenge and um, append the client challenge to it at the end. This value is then sent to the server again. The server can check whether it's valid and uh, send back the authentication result. The signature mode uh, works basically the same. You can have a one-way or a two-way signature mode. So either you verify the server before you send the data to be signed or not. The only difference is that you cannot use session information. Otherwise, the signatures would not be verifiable afterwards. And uh, the challenge is not randomly generated. But depending on the data, you can either just use the data as challenge if, if it's short enough, or you can use, for example, a hash of the, of the data. Um, for all three modes, um, you, you can probably tell um, that you need some kind of secure channel to transmit the data. Otherwise, you can easily just man in the middle er everything. Um, the usual um, way this is done is by just uh, wrapping everything in a TLS connection. That's also how we do it in our packages. Yeah, so what's the current status? In OF Toolkit, which is a collection of, of tools and libraries um, written by Simon Josephson mainly, um, we extended the support, um, the including HOTP and TOTP support to also include Okra. So we can now um, generate and validate Okra values, both with the command line tool and with the library. Um, there's a facility to generate challenges and convert them uh, to binary when necessary. And uh, the PEM module that was also pre-existing for HOTP and TOTP was also extended, but this only supports one-way authentication so far, mainly because I had, didn't have time to figure out how to do multiple queries safely in a PEM module at the moment. Um, the only other thing that's still missing uh, are wrappers for the HMAC functions for SHA-256 and 512. Because the um, crypto libraries that uh, OAuth Toolkit use at the moment uh, have SHA-256 and SHA-512 uh, methods, but no HMAC wrappers for them. So those are basically missing, and um, I will pro probably write them in the next couple of weeks sometime. And the second package I worked on was Duna Login, which is an authentication uh, client-server architecture. Um, so I extended both the server and the um, client to support uh, Okra authentication, both one-way and uh, mutual authent authentication. Duna Login also um, includes a PAM module, and uh, I also only did the one-way variant there for the same reasons, basically. Um, Duna Login right now uh, doesn't have any dependencies on uh, crypto libraries other than uh, OpenSSL and GNU TLS. So I didn't include uh, password hash calculations so far. Um, you could actually, of course, calculate the hashes each time to include in the data input, or you could uh, just store them once. But this would probably introduce new dependencies, so I didn't uh, do this so far. Yeah, Duna Login supports uh, multiple data storage uh, modules. So you can store the user data in a file or in a database. And I didn't test the database module very extensively so far. So that's also on my to-do list. Yes. So if you're interested, I would uh, give you a short uh, presentation. <laughs> um,
So there is also a short, a little uh, testing facility built in to do no login. Yeah? Uh, of course, sorry. So basically, what this test client does it, is it uses the API methods for the client library to connect to the server and test the authentication mechanisms. So what it did now is it sent a request to the server to get a challenge. The server sent back a challenge, which is, uh, in this case, a 20-character uh, hexadecimal challenge, as you can see. And we can then use the command line tool to calculate the one-time pad value. So the last part here, the th oh, again, sorry, the th three one, three two, etc., et is the reference key in the hexadecimal notation. So what you we say here is use Okra, use this suit. This is the challenge, which is the only uh, input apart from the current timestamp and the key. Um, in this case, we have a five-minute time window based on the current timestamp. Um, the command line tool also allows us to set other timestamps to test uh, one-time pad values in the future or in the past. But of course, the server will only accept the valid one for the current timestamp. So here you can see some debugging output. Um, this is the actual data input array that is uh, given to the hash function. So you have the okra suit, then the two zeros over there are the separator, and then you have the challenge, which is padded, and at the end, the timestamp, which is converted uh, as well to a number of timestamps and then copied over. And here, you can see the generated uh, okra value. And if we enter this, the test client returns zero, which means the authentication was successful. And the two-way authentication basically works the same. So you can enter some random challenge <laughs> for the server. The server will calculate a value, which you can then um, verify. Again, the debugging output, which you can ignore. And uh, I think you don't actually see that on the Beamer. And the zero back there, again, means um, the validation was successful. So this uh, server code was correct. We get a new challenge. And now we need to pass both challenges, of course. and generate a new client value, which is accepted by the server again. And of course, if you enter gibberish, it's not accepted. <laughs> yeah. Basically, the PAM module uses the same API methods to authenticate with the server. Um, one of the big problems as far as um, uh, using this in, in practice uh, is that there are no hardware dongles supporting this uh, RFC as far as I know. Correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> yeah. Which is of course kind of a chicken and egg problem because there are, besides the reference implementation included in the RFC, I'm also not aware of any software implementations. So. As long as there is no software ecosystem, there are no hardware tokens. As long as there are no hardware tokens, uh, it's kind of hard to use. So maybe this is a first step to actually push this a little further. I don't know. Are there any questions so far? Tokens here. Um, so we've got a 
a couple of these which were um, given to us by uh, Goose, um, and they make these available for free software developers. Um, one of them is a event-based token, so you press the button to get a token code, and the other is a um, time-based token. So when you press the button, it just shows the current token value, um, which increments every 30 seconds. Um, so I can pass these around. Uh, uh, yes, you can push the button. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and then we have um, then we have another one. Who's seen these calculator style tokens before? Yeah, <laughs> most people have have seen these already. So that's a typical two-way challenge um, device. Um, it takes a smart card um, and the mechanism is proprietary, so I, I don't know which mechanism is implemented in, in this you know, device. Um, but sooner or later we hope to see open and free alternatives to this that people can use. So I'll pass that around as well. Yeah, so basically that's also probably one of the reasons why it's not as widespread at the moment is that the devices for challenge response based uh, one-time pads are a lot more complicated because you need to enter the challenges. So you cannot just have one button. But uh, if you only want one-way authentication, actually you can just have a device with one button that generates a challenge. You enter the challenge. No, the other way around. Doesn't work. I'm confused. You need a pin pad, basically, or even a keyboard if you want. Uh, more than just numbers. Yeah. Does anybody else have questions for Fabian? Um. Has anybody seen the uh, the system that uh, Fedora Project is offering their developers now? That they've set something up with YubiKeys to access some of their servers and websites. Um, so there's some scope to do a similar thing for Debian infrastructure, if anybody w yeah, would prefer to have that type of access. Um, it offers the possibility that people can log in from untrusted locations. Um, there are all sorts of discussions about whether you want to do that anyway, but it does give people an extra choice that instead of logging in with a password or with an SSH key, there are some situations where they could gain access to a website um, using a, a token, either a physical device or a soft token in their phone. Even my university is offering it now to all members for their internet access. So. And they are usually not the quickest to adopt to new technology. <laughs> 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 Despite being a technical university, of course. Uh, hello. Hello. I'm Brian Ryan. Can you hear me? Right. Um, I was just going to mention that if we've got open solutions for this, then finally you might be able to solve the thing where you end up getting more and more of these tokens from any bank accounts that you've got. And if we get another one from Debian, and if people are Debian and Fedora developers, they probably don't want... What? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh. Right. Um, so if we can have open ones where you can register your token with several services, you could just have the one token, which is unlikely to happen from banks, but it might happen from open solutions. Well, for those three specifications, you would have the pro problem that all the servers would have to know the share. So you would, you would need some kind of central infrastructure to verify the codes like SAML, um, SAML server or something like this. Because otherwise you would have to spread the shared key over multiple servers and that increases the risks of uh, getting the shared key, uh, key out. And that's not good. 
I was I was thinking right now, uh, how could you have a challenge response thing where you don't have to be given the data, but you can calculate it yourself and you don't have to memorize it. And I was thinking, what about uh, zero knowledge proof based on a hash uh, database of standardized uh, identity uh, data? So you fill this out on your own, in your own computer with trusted software, and you hash it. And every time you want an institution to be able to trust you, you give out your hash database. And so they, they challenge you with uh, zero knowledge uh, proofs where you, you know your own data, so you can take the algorithms, calculate, give them the relevant digit, bit, whatever. And uh, yeah, that, that for me would be a very elegant solution to this kind of thing. I don't know how secure, but... Uh, I'm pretty sure you could make it secure. C zero knowledge proofs have been studied, right? I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, what would you use uh, um, if they can verify that you are you by just information uh, they know about you? Uh, how would anyone else, how do you uh, avoid that anyone else that has the same information can be claimed to be you? you need some shared secret in some way or something that only you know that they can verify. But um, usually people can find some of your data, but to, to really have like a complete, complete profile of your identity uh, seems to me quite hard. In any case, you could mix in there some data which are like uh, kind of random-ish, you know? like they do now with these uh, this questions where they, s they, they ask for data which is, which is kind of insignificant. Um, hmm. I don't know. <laughs> I was just thinking out loud, maybe it was garbage and you just proved it. <laughs> The problem with uh, insignificant data is that suddenly uh, my first school that I attended is actually a security token that people would want to steal and sadly I've given it to lots of banks. So um, yeah, the insignificant data suddenly becomes significant when you start using it for things that include security. Yeah, no, but they, you have to tell them the school that you went to for them to be able to work out whether it's true, because they, the, how are they uh, otherwise confirming it? Or you mean? You need a microphone. They, their date, their datum is a hashed secret, and they're asking you for zero, zero knowledge proofs that you also hold the hash secret. But you can rehash your secret anytime you want, and then apply the zero knowledge algorithms to. Oh, so you mean you you choose the question that causes the hash to be. Mixed up. Okay. Yeah. So you choose you the question and the datum, and then you have to remember that, and uh, and then they ask you to prove, to to do a yeah, so you can proof that you hold the hash data, but they don't know what the data is. They just got yeah. So you say something like, "What was my best friend at primary school's name?" and uh, that's only on your computer. Uh -huh. and, and you hash the secret and give yeah. them the hash secret. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But. I mean, whichever mechanism you use, there is always some new attack vector. Um, I mean, and there are always going to be people with a different level of understanding of the technology. So to some extent, you know, what we have here is a good technology for people who are comfortable with how it works, but, you know, people who would be comfortable using um, PGP or smart cards um, can also use um, one-time passwords um, and can probably extend that to more people through uh, s uh, soft tokens very quickly. Um, it's much faster to deploy a soft token than to deploy smart cards and help people attach things to their USB. Um, on the other hand, you know, there is uh, the risk that these tokens or the codes can be caught by a man in the middle. So if someone does capture the code and enter the code in the server faster than you can get the code to your server yourself, um, and there, there is a space of a few, yeah, maybe a, se a few seconds there where they could do that if they have some 
control over the network or the infrastructure, then there are ways they can attack this as well. Um, so there's no perfect security solution, but I mean, just to give one example of the things that users are exposed to in the real world, um, there's one scam that was in the papers the other day that the, um, that the criminals call you um, and they tell you that they call you at like on a Sunday morning after a night out, perhaps after the Debian birthday party, um, you get this phone call and it's on your landline and they say to you, oh look, someone did some spending on your card last night and, and we're, we're like the fraud alert service and we want you to call your bank. So when we get finished talking to you, then you should call the number on your card and ask them to uh, help you. Um, and so you put down the phone, you, you ring the number on the back of the card um, and they ask for all your personal details um, and because you're worried and it's early in the morning, you just answer the questions that they ask you. What's your password? What's your date of birth? What's your first school? They might go through all these things and because it's a, a fraud, you might be tempted to trust the fact that they're asking more questions than usual and you actually give them more details than usual. But what's happening here is that in um, some countries, when someone calls you, like that first call, um, and you hang up the phone, they still have your line open. They can leave your dial connected. Yeah. Yes. So yeah. when you think you've put the phone down and you've picked it up again and you're calling your bank using the number on the card, they've still got the line open and they're receiving your call, the people that called you. Um, and they I mean, this is a very low tech way of getting data from the, the end user. So. It's the same thing with these tokens. If someone can actually ring the customer and say, we want you to, to verify yourself by giving us your code, and that attacker is actually going onto the banking website <laughs> at the same time, then the customer may well be fooled into doing that. Um, so people do have to be alert to these things when they implement these solutions in practice. Yeah. yeah. Um, by the way, we used to, do, uh, to use what you were talking about in prank calls, because peop uh, people would, would try to hang up, but you still had the call, so they'd pick up again and you'd still be there. But Anyway, no, um, what I was gonna say is, that's why I was interested in a scheme where, first of all, you you are the one who gives something to them so they can aus authenticate you, and furthermore, you're not handing out the secrets. You're only, you're, you're handing out uh, something that's somewhere in the middle of the zero-knowledge proof process. So you're handing them data which is abstract, but it's good enough for someone to verify your identity through challenge response, which is a, the basis of the zero knowledge protocol. So if it gets stolen from anyone, what do they have? They have data that allows them to verify you, but they still need, I mean, the verifying you doesn't allow them to, 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 to verify before someone else because the way the zero knowledge protocol works is uh, they, they might generate one set of challenge responses, but they can't go through the whole thing. It's uh, mathematically unrealizable. Anyway. Oh yeah, if anybody wants to look at the code or play around, it's on my GitHub page at the moment. Okay, so thanks Fabian for giving us this overview of the, the project. Um, I mean, it's, it's really good that the progress you've made so far as well. Um, so it's good to be able to actually see it working when we've still got you know, more than six weeks of the summer of code left to go. Um, so I hope that people will, will be able to try it out and give um, Fabian some feedback during the summer as well. Um, the packages for Dynalogin and Oath Toolkit are in Debian, they're in Wheezy, they're in Unstable. Uh, but the latest work that Fabian has done is in um, your own repository. Yes. 
Yeah, so you have to build it from source um, to get all these uh, groovy new features. So thanks, Fabian. Okay.